Good afternoon, all. We're going. This is Dale Singer from RPA, and we're going to get started in about one minute. And we're all being quiet on our very best behavior. Hello. Hello. Yep. Jenny here. Hi. Hey, Jenny. Okay, I think we're going to get started. Good afternoon, all. Welcome to the National Dialysis Safety Program webinar on the culture of safety. I'm Dale Singer, RPA's Executive Director, and I will be serving as your moderator today. This is the first in a series of four webinars RPA is hosting on various patient safety topics. Your telephone lines are currently on mute. Should you want to ask a question or make a comment, please click raise your hand and your line will be unmuted during the discussion. You may also type onto the ch into the chat box that's on your screen. We'll answer questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Please keep your line muted if you are not speaking, and do not place your phone on hold so that we don't hear music or other distractive noise. Please keep in mind the webinar is being recorded. And with that, I would like to introduce Renee Garrick. She is the chair of RPA's Quality, Safety, and Accountability Committee. She's a, clinical, she's a professor, professor of clinical medicine, vice dean and section chief of renal for Westchester Medical Center, New York Medical College. She's also a former board member of the Renal Physicians Association, and she serves on the New York State Committee for the Safety Evaluation of Office-Based Surgery. Renee? Uh, thanks very much, Dale, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. I just want to give you a little bit of background about our webinar series. Uh, about a year ago, the RPA, along with a multi-stakeholder group that included healthcare professionals and industry and patients, uh, thought that we should try to take steps to leverage all of the work that all of these organizations have been doing to foster patient safety activities within our dialysis units. And the concept has been that the steering committee chose several key areas that have been the source of safety initiatives throughout the country. And the plan for the webinar series is to draw together stakeholders who will share information and best practices across the domains of culture of safety, which is our first webinar today, medication reconciliation, which is coming up in a couple of weeks on the October 30th, then infection control, and finally we will wrap up with a safety webinar on transition of care and the safety risks that transition uh, uh, presents us with. The concept of each webinar is that we will talk about best practices and share about the things that we've learned. And then the hope is at the end of the seminar series, the group will convene to think about next steps and to take what we've learned in our sharing process and try to determine some questions about what can be done. So those three questions really look at can a culture of safety be developed within dialysis facilities? What are the best practices for getting staff and patients engaged in safety efforts? And are there practical tools that we could share and leverage all of our common experience to work together to set across the renal communi community a safety initiative? And our first webinar today is going to be led initially by Alan Kleiger. And Alan, I wanted to turn it over to you. I think we all know Alan well. Um, Amy is going to advance the slide so we can introduce him a bit. Alan is the head of safety at Yale. He's an expert in process and outcome quality measures, as well as a clinical expert in end-stage renal disease care, with a lot of uh, work on the transition of care from stage 4 chronic kidney disease to ESRD, and then to successful renal replacement therapy and anemia management. And he is, of course, the former president of the RPA. So, Alan, I think that if you could lead us on the first part of our seminar. Thanks, Renee. Uh, I really want to spend the first 10 or 12 minutes 
uh, with sort of a general overview of what we know um, and uh, some of the challenges in patient safety in our dialysis units. On my first slide that's titled, How Safe is the Dialysis Facility? We know that our dialysis facilities in many ways have the risk factors that intensive care units in hospitals do. Our patients have multi-system disease, are cared for by a large team of physicians who often do not regularly communicate with one another, and therefore our patients' care is often uncoordinated or at best um, only modestly well coordinated, uh, rendering it uh, high risk for errors. Our patients take many medications and communication challenges um, uh, we've all seen uh, be uh, substantial uh, risks for failing systems. Also, our facilities themselves are complex, uh, complex the way intensive care units are. Fall risk is high in our frail and often elderly patients. We're dealing always with uh, water and solute contents that pose risk to our patients. Infection control, a major concern um, regarding uh, specifically whether or not hand hygiene is done well and uh, passing along infection to our patients and those who have to have central venous catheters. Our patients get regular vac vascular access and our machines have to be set up, set up correctly, set up in the right sequence um, and, uh, and uh, repeated uh, several thousand times a day across the country. So, we know that our dialysis unit and our patients are at particular risk for um, safety violations or safety difficulties. On the next slide that's called Elements of ESRD Patient Safety, I've had a chance to look through the literature up through April of this year when um, I put together this paper that's referenced at the bottom of this slide that really goes through the literature and what's known about patient safety. Uh, and really, there are five major elements that I'm going to touch on briefly in the next 10 minutes. The first, which is the main subject of today, is the culture of safety, what it means, um, and how we think about that. A second is the importance of human factors engineering, particularly to our patients. The third is identifying the major causes of adverse outcomes. The fourth is an appreciation of the need for root cause analysis whenever we do have near misses or real, uh, uh, or real safety events. And finally, the importance of involving our patients in safety efforts. So on the next slide, um, uh, where in the upper left-hand corner you see the Yale New Haven Hospital Health System logo, I want to share with you just some of the experience that we've had at the Yale Health System over the last two years now to system-wide promote a culture of safety and to have that uh, culture really make a difference. A culture of safety can and has been defined as having three major elements. First is that we all in our systems have communication founded on trust, where I can feel empowered to be able to say to a colleague, you know, I, I didn't see you uh, wash your hands before you went in to see this patient. Um, and he would be empowered not to be defensive, but to say, thank you, my God, I don't know how I missed that. Thank you for pointing that out. So communication founded on trust. A second element of a culture of safety is a shared perception of the importance of safety, where safety as the first order of business is accepted and is promoted from the highest right down to the lowest level of our systems. And the third uh, 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 element of culture of safety is the, is the confidence that preventive measures can be um, uh, put together and can uh, work, can be efficacious. In order to achieve that culture of safety, we've helped our 20,000 plus employees and our several thousand physicians who admit to our system uh, we've helped them with some tools, uh, and I just want to go over two tools that might intuitively seem obvious and not even worthy of thought, but nonetheless turn out to be extremely important in promoting that culture of safety with the idea that safety starts with me. And we use the CHAMP logo, C-H-A-M-P, and for those C is communicate clearly. And so the question in your dialysis units is, do you have readbacks? Do you have callbacks? Do you have the tools 
in which we know that we're communicating effectively? Do we have, second of all, H4 uh, handoff effectively? What's actually happening? What tools or what methods do you have in your dialysis facilities to assure that we're thinking of effective handoffs? Are you getting the right uh, information from hospitals when patients come back to your units? And as importantly, are you giving the kind of important information when patients leave your units? Do you track that? Do you have tools to assist you with that? And do you audit that? Do you have some way of knowing whether the tools you're using are effective? That's H. A in CHAMP is attention to detail. We all tend to want to reduce things to their common denominators. Oh, you know, we have trouble with uh, patients uh, uh, and vascular access, and uh, we have trouble knowing that uh, uh, nurses are competent at putting in needles into fistulas. We reduce it to sort of common denominators. But what we know in the culture of safety is that the details are important for any particular patient. What is the specific issue and challenge? What are the patient and family's attitudes? Attention to detail is critical in a safe environment. The M is mentoring each other. And what we like to say is that we're 200% accountable. What? 200%? Right. 200% means I'm 100% accountable for myself and what I do. But I'm also accountable for what you do. That we're responsible for each other. And then if we're going to maintain a safe environment, then as a team, we accept the fact that we want people looking over our shoulders, and we want to do things collaboratively, and we are responsible for each other. And finally, P is to practice and accept a questioning attitude. When a technician says to the medical director of a dialysis facility, you know, I, I, I'm concerned about what we're doing um, about um, infection control, um, does, does that uh, uh, director say, no, 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 we have everything right, we have meetings, we're talking about it, we have uh, committees, uh, don't worry about it, we're all set. Or does that director say, gosh, thank you for raising that concern, what specific concern do you have and what, what is it that, that you may be seeing that, that perhaps we're not seeing? And so we really promote practicing and accepting a questioning attitude. This CHAMP uh, uh, approach is something that we regularly find helpful by having daily 15-minute um, sessions, huddles, each day to consider what are the safety issues we've seen in the last 24 hours? What can we look forward to in the next 24 hours? What have you heard in any of these cues in the CHAMP logo? On the next slide is a self-check list that, again, we ask all practitioners to use. You know, of course, that we often do so many things on autopilot, right? The classic example is you get into your car when you leave your house, and you pull into the parking lot at work, and then stop and say, oh my god, how did I get here? Um, often the same thing, those regular kinds of activities that we do are present when we're working. When a nurse is uh, hooking up a central venous catheter, that she has done that way for the last, you know, 10 years. Um, it's automatic, uh, little thinking involved. You know, often, in fact, she's thinking about her son's basketball game that's coming up or what she's doing when she leaves work. There's lots going on. The self-star check says it's worth taking literally a couple of seconds to, number one, stop and focus on what you're doing. Then consider exactly what you're about to do. That's the think. To do the act, whatever it is you're going to do. And then take a moment to see how it went. Did it go OK? Were there any problems? Were there any barriers? Anything I should learn? We're teaching all of ourselves and our staff to use this self-check star checklist, taking just a few seconds to help focus on the task when we're about to do it. So those are sort of the elements, some of the elements of a culture of safety that we've found really important. On the next slide is what we're aiming to be, which is a high reliability organization. That is organization that succeeds in avoiding serious safety events in an environment where normal accidents can be expected because of high risk. And again, the best example of that is the uh, deck of an aircraft carrier, where there's this little dot moving around in the ocean and big airplanes that take off and land on it, and 18 and 19-year-olds that are on that deck keeping everything safe. 
But it's remarkable that they do that because they do that in a condition where you'd expect there to be high risk of accidents and complexity. But they do it because of the training that everybody on that deck has uh, with the elements of a culture of safety that we've already discussed. The principles listed on this slide I won't go through because you can see what they are, and I know that most of you know these, but I just want to spend just a moment talking about the last one, resilience. We know that accidents do happen, even though we have our best efforts to avoid mistakes and avoid errors, that we're human and they do occasionally happen. And when they do, our systems need to be prepared to respond to them, to know what to do when something goes wrong, to know what to do if there's a needle dislodgement and a major blood leak, perhaps to have had simulation training of the nurses and staff involved so that people know their roles and know what to do to keep patients safe in that condition. But also in addition to that, to be resilient, we have to respond to the needs that we as caregivers have if we actually hurt somebody. None of us wants to hurt someone. But when we do, we frequently suffer from that. We feel guilty, we feel horribly responsible, and that can impair our ability to be good caretakers. And so that we and others like us have established programs that are called second victim programs. The second victim being, well, the first victim is the patient who gets hurt, the second victim, the caregiver who unfortunately made a mistake, and providing peer support and, if necessary, professional support to get that right. On the next slide, you'll see that the second thing we talk a lot about is human factors engineering. What I mean by that is that um, we know that the way we as humans respond often determine what we actually do rather than what we're actually supposed to do. And human factors engineering means understanding the way we humans work and there are now human factors engineered, um, uh, trained engineers doing this kind of work. For example, the top one says usability testing. And that means examining systems in real-world conditions. The example of that is that we often have policies and procedures that have multiple steps in doing a particular task that are set out that way because it stays that way. But we know that often we humans, our, our technicians, our nurses, our physicians, do these little workarounds, have their own way of doing something that's not quite what the policy or procedure is but is a workaround that feels better or feels more efficient to the person doing it. If, if a mistake happens and a workaround has been used, the easiest thing would be to point to that person and say, you're at fault because you broached, you, you breached policy. You didn't do what you were supposed to do. This is all your fault. Uh, next time, do what's on the policy. But what's more productive often is to understand why that workaround was done in the first place. What was it about that policy and procedure that somehow was too onerous or too difficult or too long for that particular practitioner and therefore a workaround was done? So using human factors engineering to understand that and the other pieces of human factors engineering shown here are critical parts of the culture of safety. On the next slide, uh, I'm then going to go through a few of the th facts that all of us know about the major sources of error in dialysis units. The first and probably the most common are medication errors. You all know that most of our patients take an average of between 6 and 10 uh, medications per day, 40 doses of medicines a day, that omissions of an ordered medication are remarkably common and that we know that to reduce medication errors in addition to the electronic medical records we're all now using, that we need to have two other critical pieces. One is a way of actually knowing what our patients are taking and how that compares to what we think they're taking, and whether medicines that patients get in the hospital when they come back to the unit are being used correctly and whether they integrate properly with what they had previously been prescribed. So medication reconciliation and effective if, uh, reconciliation is critical. This is a piece that I have found that most of us do poorly and that we need some hardwired tools in those transitions of care that guide us to guarantee in those transitions that we get it right. 
And of course, we'll be spending a whole a period of time talking about those transitions. On the next slide, infections, a second major cause of morbidity and sometimes mortality among our patients. In a survey that the RPA uh, and other uh, organizations working with us did both in 2006 and then a repeat one in 2013, we found that if we uh, got responses from a sampling of nurses, doctors, and other professionals across the country, a countrywide sampling, that nearly half of those professionals reported that they'd seen staff who failed to wash their hands or change gloves before touching access lines in the three months before the questionnaire was given. We know that although we talk about appropriate hand hygiene, that it's all too frequent that it's not always done. We also know that central venous catheters are a major source of morbidity. Um, and of course, we want to work hard to reduce their use. But there are several other things we've learned along the line that might be very helpful at reducing infections. Scrubbing the hub, chlorhexidine, sometimes even honey, which has been shown to be as effective as is mupirocin in preventing um, staphylococcal infections. So that's infections. And on the next slide, access-related events we know are also important. I won't go through the details of this other than to say that we know that uh, access uh, failures um, are relatively infrequent. Needle dislodgements causing major bleeding, for example, is unlikely, unusual, but when it happens, it can be uh, life-threatening. And so preparing for that, knowing what team members do, perhaps even simulation and simulation training around that is something that can be very important. The next slide outlines quickly falls. We know that falls uh, are critically important to our patients. And we know that uh, falls are much more frequent in patients who come to dialysis than they are in the uh, general population. We also know that there are risk factors associated with falls that are listed on this slide. A good uh, proactive dialysis facility able to reduce the number of falls uh, will um, anticipate this, will train their staff to do a falls risk analysis and to support with gait training and other aids those patients who are particularly prone to falls. Next slide shows that patient falls are increased particularly among frail dialysis patients. And in fact, there was just published a paper uh, where Cynthia Delgado was the primary author um, that comes out of San Francisco uh, and the VA system there that looked particularly at patients on dialysis and found that even if you ask patients to self-report if they were frail or not, those reporting self-reporting frailty were twice as likely to have falls as those who were not. The next slide shows the strategies that have been used to reduce falls that are very helpful. And then finally, what I want to say is that deaths from dialysis complication on the next slide, while very rare, nonetheless deserve attention to the things that we can do differently. Only 1.4 deaths per thousand patients per year from these complications. Far less frequent than infection or medication errors. But the ones that are important to know is that hyperkalemia, even among our dialysis patients, is still a clear and measurable cause of preventable death. Medication prescription errors, handoff errors after care hours, infection and vascular access management. Each of these well described in a publication last year by Bray that's referenced at the bottom of the slide. On the next slide, uh, this comes from a publication uh, that um, uh, Renee Garrick is the principal author on and Jenny Kitson, who's on the call, was a major uh, contributor to that asked professionals why they thought major reasons for medical mistakes were made in dialysis units. These two surveys we did, one in 2006, the second in 2013, as you see, staff do not follow procedures was the leading reason that staff themselves gave as the major reasons for um, not adhering uh, uh, to, uh, not, not, not of, of having a b bad medical mistakes. The last thing I want to say, finally, on the last slide of mine, 
is that it's incredibly important to involve patients in safety efforts. Remember, our patients sit there in the facility the whole time they're there. Their eyeballs are usually open. They're listening to things around. And they're probably the most, the richest source of information about what's safe, what's not safe, what's actually happening in the unit. Not only to them, but to everyone else who's in the unit. So it's critically important, we believe, to involve patients in the safety efforts. The Joint Commission uh, promotes it. CMS and the networks have encouraged it. These are the critical elements. All right, well, that's it for my presentation. I'm hoping that uh, some will have some thoughts or comments after we get done. But let me just briefly introduce, if I may, Tammy Keir, Dr. Tammy Keir, um, who is an assistant professor of nursing at Villanova um, and uh, has done, uh, along uh, with colleagues, the first national study investigating the culture of safety in nephrology nurse practice settings. Uh, Tammy. Thank you, Dr. Kleiger. I'm going to make sure I can advance my slides when I'm able to do so. So yes, as it was mentioned, myself and colleague Dr. Beth Ulrich conducted the first national study looking at practice settings, nephrology nurse practice settings, and the culture of safety. We conducted this study on behalf of the American Nephrology Nurses Association in the spring of 2014. And as I stated, it's the first study that looked at the culture of safety, specifically in, in nephrology nurse practice settings. And I'll define those settings, but we certainly were not solely focusing on the hemodialysis inpatient and outpatient unit, but tried to encompass all nephrology practice settings. So in doing that, we pulled items from the AHRQ hospital as well as medical office tools. And again, so that we could reach our transplant clinics, our PD clinics, our CD, CKD clinics, we knew that we could not just look at the AHRQ safety um, items that related to the care of patients in a hospital setting. We needed to pull in some of those medical office items as well. And so we went through both of those tools and pulled out items. I will also say that we added a couple of items based upon our experience as nephrology nurses to specifically address our patient population as well. And it was important that we use this AHRQ um, tool because we had comparison data that's available readily online so that we could compare our statistical findings to this comparison data. I will tell you that the responses that we received to the survey far exceeded our initial expectations. We were hoping to get maybe 300, 400 responses from the nephrology nurses. Um, and very quickly, we had 400, 500 responses, 700 responses. Then we started getting greedy. Maybe we'll get 800, maybe we'll get 900. And we ended up with 979 responses from the nephrology nurse population throughout the United States. And here you'll actually see that we were, we were able to use data from 929 of those respondents to our survey. 50 identified that they were not working in a nephrology patient care setting, and so we excluded the data from those 50 individuals. Very likely they were working in an academic or possibly a research setting but did not have patient contact. And we were going right to the, the direct care providers or at least those providers that were working with a nephrology patient population directly. So when we an analyzed our data, we had data from 929 individuals to analyze. My next slide will show you how the, these individuals broke down into primary roles. So we had about 27% of our population in the manager administrator role. I will say that the individuals who answered the survey self-identified their primary role and we only allowed them to select one role. So there, you know, these individuals could have held multiple roles. They could have been an educator and in other times a direct care provider, but we allowed them to select one primary role where they spent the majority of their time in practice. As you can see and as you would expect, a little over 50% of our respondents were in that direct care bedside chair side role. A little over 5% were advanced practice nurses, 9% educators, 5% uh, said other primary roles, and then we had slightly over 1% who did not list the primary role within the survey. When we analyzed the data, well, first and foremost, hello? I'm sorry, I thought I heard someone speak in. Um, when we analyzed the data, the first thing that we did is we realized that we had a significant amount of data to analyze and that certainly we could not put all of this data into a single publication. And so we do have six publications to date and they're listed within 
this PowerPoint presentation, and a few of them are also located within the webinar itself. One of the areas that we looked at are the primary role results. So we actually broke down the data by the roles that the nurses identified as holding. And we, we realized that when we looked at the manager's roles and their perceived data, that they perceived higher safety standards in their work units than did those respondents in the um, direct care role. And that was in every single item that that manager rated the patient safety culture more positively than the direct care nurse's role. And that spoke to us very loud and clear. We also, when we statistically looked at the significance, there were large differences within these two populations between the positive perception of patient safety culture with, with the nurse managers compared to the direct care providers. We looked at the primary work unit. We saw that, again, not surprisingly, slightly over 50% of those who responded worked in the chronic hemodialysis unit. About 23% worked in the acute hemodialysis unit. A little less than 2% worked in the nephrology inpatient transplant unit. We had about 8.6% in our PD clinics, 4% in our outpatient clinics, a little over 1% in our medical office clinics. Again, it was important for us to understand where the individuals were working, and so we separated that data out and have those results. Our nephrology nurses who identified that their primary work unit was that chronic hemodialysis unit rated patient safety lower in that unit than those nurses working in the acute hemo unit or the peritoneal dialysis unit. And there was a statistically significant difference between those two groups, or actually I should say those groups. When we look at the chronic hemo unit, there was a statistically significant difference between that group and the acute hemodialysis nurses and the peritoneal dialysis nurses. This quantitative study also had a qualitative uh, piece. We had two open-ended questions, and I'll get to that some, of, some of that data going forwardly, forward. But one of the things that the nurses reported is that lack of staffing was a commonly reported problem in the chronic hemodialysis unit. And we seem to hear that theme time and time again. The nurses also reported in the chronic and acute hemodialysis units that filling rushed was a common problem. They had to move patients through in a shorter period of time and in some cases were being even asked to move a larger volume of patients through in a defined period of time. The acute dialysis nurses also identified that long staff hours was a major issue and sometimes those long staff hours related to call or not having someone else to come in and relieve them or back them up so that they could take a break or even finish at the end of a day. We looked at the organization as well as the number of years of experience. And what we found, and this actually for our statistical part, actually worked out very nicely because we almost had an exact split between for-profit and not-for-profit. About 52% of our participants worked in the for-profit sector and a little about 47% were not worked in the not-for-profit sector. You can see, as we would expect for those of us working in the hemodialysis setting and the acute setting, clinic settings that the nurses who come into nephrology nursing have a tendency to stay. So years as a registered nurse were about 24 and a half years and about eight and about a little over 18 years were spent as a nephrology nurse. So we have a highly seasoned group of nephrology nurses who are responding to this survey. When we looked at the organizational work setting, what we found, and again, we had statistical significance in this data as well, is that respondents from the for-profit organizations rated patient safety culture lower than did the respondents from the not-for-profit organizations. And they rated it lower from the for-profit sector in every single item. It was a pretty lengthy tool because, again, as I said, we brought HRQ items together from two different tools. So it was a pretty lengthy tool, and in every item we saw a statistically significant difference between these two groups. We also saw that 43% of the respondents in the for-profit group either agreed or strongly agreed that management and leadership decisions are too often based on what's best for the organization rather than what's best for the patient. <clears throat> and we saw that 27% of the individuals held disbelief in the not-for-profit organizations. Again, achieving statistical significance with this particular item as well. 
We asked the nurses to rate their unit on the overall um, grade of safety. And when we look at the NNPS, that's the nephrology nurse um, practice setting, you can see that this we brought all groups together, regardless of their practice setting, regardless of their identified role in that nephrology setting. And so you can see that here we're comparing our results on the top line in NPS with the AHRQ hospital data that we had at the time from 2014. And you can see in some areas we did a little bit better, and in some areas we did a little bit worse. It's not terribly different from what we saw with the AHRQ hospital data that we compared it to. We asked them overall, how would you rate the systems and processes your unit has in place to prevent, catch, and correct problems that have the potential to affect all patients? Um, and again, you can see that in, you know, we have about 58% who rated excellent to very good, and then the rest fall into the acceptable, poor, or failing. So again, we do have some work that we need to continue to do. I like this one, what some people call a wordle. So essentially what we did is we asked them the question, please describe a patient safety issue in your unit that causes or has caused concern. Then identify if the issue was resolved and how. And as um, we were not expecting the number of stories and narratives that we received back from the nurses. We had over 300 stories or narratives where the individuals wanted to answer this question or the next question. And when you look at the words that we have here on this slide, you'll You'll see that the words that are um, of the largest font size were the most frequently mentioned words, um, and compared to the other words. So these were words that were that were commonly mentioned, not resolved. They spoke about issues, little monthly audits. So you can take a look and see those words on your own. The second question that we asked said, please provide us with an additional, any additional information or comments about patient safety, errors, or event reporting in your nephrology practice setting in general. And again, you can see mistakes, um, nurse, outside reporting, system safety are some of the common words that we received. So what we did is using qualitative methods. Amy, it's not advancing. If you could advance the slide, please. Thank you. So we took these 300 narratives and we analyzed for themes. And these were the themes that came forward. As I go through these themes with you, and I'm going to mention each of them quickly, it was very difficult within many of these narratives to separate one theme from the other. Because in many narratives, there were a number of overlapping themes. One theme led to the issue, but the issue kind of circled back to the theme. So Underreporting of events and of ev actual events and near misses was the most commonly mentioned theme within the first 10 minutes of me receiving this data and actually sitting and looking at the data, the quantitative as well as qualitative data. It was a glaringly obvious that the nurses wanted to talk about the underreporting of events and near misses. Um, and as I go down and I mention the rest of these themes, every single subsequent theme. Can, comes back and contributes to the underreporting of events or, or near misses. They talked about inadequate or unsafe staffing. Many nurses said, we just don't report because we're too busy. We don't have time to report it. The long work hours, which again comes into the staffing issue. Communication lapses. They talked about the lack of feedback cycle and getting information back onto the units again when events are reported. Or the difficulty in actually navigating cumbersome documentation systems and reporting systems. Training issues came forward, or shall I say the lack of training, issues relating to compliance, infection control certainly rose to the top when we talked about compliance issues and infection control infringements were certainly part of that as well. So all of these themes, we, we create certainly some type of graph to show you how all of these are intertwined together. Advance the slide, please. So again, underreporting of events was the most commonly mentioned safety culture issue. And here are a couple of quotes from the nurses. I feel near misses are underreported, and there needs to be more emphasis and education about reporting, or event reporting is hit or miss. Sometimes a nurse will have time to file a report, and other times it's too chaotic. Advance the slide. 
But I also want you to understand that we didn't hear just the negative part. I know that to date, to this point, I've talked about some of the negative data that we received back. But also within those narratives, the nurses also talked about best practices or successes that they've had in their nephrology practice setting. The nurses talked about non-punitive and transparent event reporting. And Alan just gave us a great example from Yale as to how that's happening there. The use of effective and efficient documentation documentation systems. The nurse talked about ways in which the documentation articulates with the nurse manager or administrator's documentation system or the hospital documentation system. The nurses talked about strategies to decrease falls. And Alan, again, mentioned some of the ways in which that has been brought forward in other pieces of literature. The nurses talked about improved medication administration safety, as well as ways in which they they prevented the patient from missing actual doses of medications. The nurses talked about scheduled safety huddles, meetings, timeouts, safety homerooms. They called it a variety of different names, and they described those to us very clearly as well. So one of the positive quotes that I received, and again, we had a number of positive quotes, we have a program in place to identify potential risks and try to prevent them before they happen. We have a safety meeting on a quarterly basis with members of the interdisciplinary team. One of our main concerns is patient safety, and we have a short homeroom meeting daily with all staff and discuss any potential safety issues. Negative, a negative comment, my dialysis clinic is constantly in a reaction mode, as is as is the entire organization. The business strategy seems to be to put the profits above all else, and when a patient, safe, when patient safety is found to be compromised by state, state surveyors, a team comes in and fixes the problem, but the solutions are temporary. There's little emphasis on being proactive and realizing true profitable gains by retaining staff through a positive work environment, truly delivering service excellence and fostering an honest dialogue about what is happening in each unit. So one of the things that I'll mention to you is after Beth and I conducted this study, we actually went back to those AHRQ items and we developed within our first publication, and I have it listed here at the bottom, from September, October 2014 and in the Nephrology Nursing Journal, we developed a mini AHRQ tool because we wanted to provide something to the um, nephrology practice settings that they can actually take out into the setting and they can use to assess their culture of safety. So it's a short mini tool and it will help identify one particular issue that the dialysis and nephrology settings can start with to move towards this positive culture of safety. Here are the references as well that list some of the work that um, Dr. Ulrich and I have recently completed. Thank you. <coughs> Thus, uh, thanks very much, Tammy. This is uh, Renee. I was just going to jump in for a second and maybe recap that I think what we've heard is that we have a real hunger out there among the nursing staff. They're eager and interested in developing cultures of safety. Alan recapped for us the concepts and the resources and tools that are available to establish a concept of, I'm sorry, a culture of safety. And Tammy just gave us a frontline view of how our staff think we're doing. And I think as caregivers, we, we all, all of us really only have one goal, and that's to deliver the safest care possible to every patient who's sitting in our units as we speak right now. Someplace across the street is a dialysis patient under our care, sitting in, in a chair counting on us to deliver the safest care we can. I wanted to ask uh, Nancy Foley to give us a very quick update about some of the work that they've been doing with Renal Ventures, and then we're going to open it up for conversation about best practices and things that the stakeholders who are on the call, all of whom are obviously highly trained experts in our world, to talk a bit among ourselves about our thoughts about safety within our units and some of the things we might do as a, as a stakeholder group as our next step. So Nancy, if you want to tell us a bit about what the Renal Ventures has been doing. Nancy, um, you need to enter your PIN in order for us to unmute you. Um, I'm not sure if you have that or not. Could you send that to her again uh, by email, just in case she does not? And then uh, let's let's move on until we can hear from Nancy. Right. Okay. So in so, the meantime, go ahead, Alan. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> Nancy, Nancy's actually with us. <laughs> okay, great. Ah, great. Hi, everybody. Um, 
I just wanted to review some of the things that we did very quickly. Um, I would say probably about two years ago, we put together a national safety committee. It was interdisciplinary, um, including operations, education, compliance, biomed, and acute services. Um, we also used the um, AHRQ website and the ESRD um, toolkit as one of our primary resources. However, we've put together um, specific things that would affect our culture and connect with our culture. Um, one, of the, one of the tools that really made a significant impact from the AHRQ was the undermining a culture of safety video. If anybody has not watched that, it really made a profound effect and had positive feedback from our staff. Um, another thing that we did was we wanted to quantify this underreporting, reporting and underreporting. So um, we had a software program which um, collected our hotline complaints on the compliance side. We expanded our connection with that vendor and also um, channeled all of our AORs through that in alignment with our um, policy management system. So now we're able to identify throughout the organization what our AORs, our highest number AORs are, and it could be unit specific and throughout the organization, which gives us um, corporate employees the ability, the ability to assist through action plan development um, locally with our staff. Uh, we realized that safety needs to be a priority, so we add, added a quarterly safety template, which the National Committee um, created to highlight AORs reviews, OSHA form completion, uh, the list of disinfectants that were used, all of our life safety um, reviews, um, generator compliance, disaster review, product evaluation forms. And um, just like Dr. Kleiger said, um, medication errors, treatment errors, falls, other safety risks. There were two initiatives that really made a big impact. And it was the best practice in one of our clinics, which was a sparkle initiative. They wanted a sparkle when the State Department of Health came in, meaning infection control initiatives and anything else. And it was one of our five-star clinics that did this. and. Any time they saw somebody violating a policy or a practice or a questionable activity, they would call a sparkle on you. And the patients didn't know what it meant, and they just said sparkle so that it would keep everybody in check. It was just one of those um, open mutual validations that worked tremendously in that clinic. Another thing is any any time where you want to pr promote a new campaign, you need a mascot. We put out um, a contest through our organization to come up with the with the safety mascot. Um, we had sev many, many submissions, and we came up with our general safety. He was published on all of our handouts, all of our documentations, on our calendar. And as our safety committee evolved, our marketing committee actually made him a bobblehead, a true, you know, dimensional bobblehead. And he kind of acts currently as almost like the elf on the shelf. When he's there and people are watching, whether it's general safety or anyone else, people tend to comply more. And um, our general safety was really well received. Just a, a few anecdotal stories that worked for us. Any questions? Any questions? So Renee, do you want to open it perhaps to uh, some discussion, best practice, and questions? So I think what would be interesting would be is to hear from our stakeholder group of activities that people think would are being done in the units now, if people have tools that they have to share. What people take is from hearing about the frontline staff's perception about safety and the little bit of disconnect that we heard from Tammy regarding the impression of managers versus the impression of frontline staff. So I'd be interested in hearing the conversation from the, from the group of what thoughts people might have. Are our units as safe as we think they are? 
You know, are there things that we could do as a group to focus on establishing a culture of safety? And are there things that different people's, uh, people on the call are doing already within their units that they could share in addition to what Nancy just talked about? I'm not sure if people can be unmuted to talk. Do you know, oh. Amy? We are in the process of unmuting. OK. But we've asked people if, if they have questions or comments, if they can use the chat box in the meantime. OK. Some people are unmuted. We have a, several questions in the chat box. Um, I can't read everyone who's put a question into the chat box, so maybe if there's people who are unmuted who could speak and tell us what they're doing in their unit and what they're thinking about is their safety event. Uh, Jenny, in your experience in the Five Diamond process, do you think the units are largely engaged in that throughout the country? Do we have a lot of um, enrollment still in Five Diamond? And do we have a lot of support for that across the dialysis community? Um, actually, it varies from uh, region to region. Um, I haven't looked at the data recently, but it's at one point um, about a year ago, it was, about, um, it was mostly funneled through through the ESRD networks, there was about 13 networks that were actively uh, pursuing and promoting um, the use of the Five Diamond project. And at that point, um, I think we were under um, not quite at a thousand facilities, so less than half of the facilities were taking advantage of the Five Diamond modules and using that. Now that's that's about a year ago. So if, if I had known, I would have looked up the data. So I apologize. Yeah. But, Jenny, this, so, is uh, Nancy. this is Nancy. Oh, good, Nancy. Can you hear me. Oh, good. Oh, good. Um, okay. Good. Please correct yeah. me. Uh, yeah, as of 2015, <coughs> as of this point, um, year to date, we've had about 1,300 uh, dialysis good. facilities that are participating in the program. That's about 21 percent of the uh, facilities nationally, and the program has now been um, endorsed by both uh, DCI and Fresenius, um, as well as the uh, various associations like RPA, ANA, AAKP, and NRAA. And at the Network 5 board meeting, which was held just yesterday, the board authorized um, some funding for us so that we could um, analyze the automated data for 2014 and 2015. So we're, we'll be doing that soon. And we do have um, uh, just a lot of information, because in 2014, we had an additional 1,300 facilities that were participating in the Five Diamond program. So probably in the first half of 2016, I hope to have a pretty significant report. And as Jenny mentioned, there are 12 of the 18 networks that are participating. So. Uh, the other thing that might help the staff, because I remember the discussion talking about you know frontline staff and how do you engage them. Uh, just to remind again uh, the people on the call is that um, you know you can get CEUs for your technicians, um, you know, because the models have been approved, um, you know for CEUs, so that's another incentive that might be able to be used to engage you know, your frontline staff um, in, in terms of doing more actively uh, enrollment and you know, use of the modules. So, so one of the things that, that I've heard as we've talked about this is that people say they're too busy to do Five Diamond and that they don't have enough resources or they don't have time carved out of their day to be able to participate. Have you guys had that kind of feedback? Again, going to some of the things that Tammy was talking about in terms of staffing and ability to put aside time. Yeah, it, it does have some a time commitment is required, Renee. I have not heard that uh, specifically, um, but I can see that. It's not designed to be an um, online, on-demand type program. It's, it's designed to be a program that is done as a team within the dialysis facility. There's a uh, presenter, and then there's you know, uh, discussion and various activities. So um, there is a time commitment, but I think that that's required for anything for patient safety, or any of the work that is done in the dialysis center. So yeah, uh, maybe it's a valid complaint. I don't know. 
Or maybe it's an issue of us all educating staff that some of that work could be done during a staff meeting and that staff meetings could be set aside for safety or a portion of it set aside for safety activity and for safety updates that could be utilized and that the program could be wedded into that. And the, the other thing that I was wanted to ask the group is I know the CDC put together some very nice data on their infection control work in units. And this goes back to Tammy's frontline comment that the staff felt rushed and they often did workarounds because they felt that they had to do workarounds to get through the day. And the CDC data suggested that standardization actually improved that and that all, it may seem in the beginning that standardized approaches are, are annoying, that in the end of the day they actually save time, reduce error, and allow everyone to do things the same way consistently, which is what Alan's point was in the beginning about how high reliability. This is Cindy Kristen. It, what, uh, the, the idea that um, management uh, nurses and the, the floor nurses really had different perceptions of safety I think was a real kick in the butt. Um, and, and I think that just making, the, making people aware of that, including the medical director, and then I think that there are also little things that can be done. I mean, you could take any one of Alan's tools there uh, and just even the um, the idea of, of saying or the, 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 of saying sparkle when there when you see an error, I mean, you, you can take it in little steps too, to which may increase awareness um, in other areas just by just by starting small. But also that awareness that there are differences in perceptions. I think that's huge. Certainly, send. This is Tammy, and I will say that, that that data is across the board. When you look at data from a variety of hospital settings, we are not unique in the practice of nephrology, nephrology nursing. We, we are just like the other groups, that direct care providers at the bedside chair side see it one way, and managers see it another. And actually, I think there's a there's a two-way street to that, too, because when you look at the, those in the direct chair side care, look at their under-reporting, and that is one of the biggest problems that came, you know, came forward with the particular data that Beth and I collected, under-reporting. Certainly, managers are not going to be aware of those issues. Um, and there were a number of reasons for under-reporting, which I can't get into, you know, because the reasons were so many, and I'd be happy to you get back to anyone and share any part of the data or you can look at the articles. But it definitely is a two-way street. Under-reporting prevents the managers from understanding or the managers sometimes don't follow up and that leads to under-reporting. goes back and forth. But we're no different than other areas of practice. Is there anyone on the call that's had experience with safety huddles? Not in dialysis units, in hospitals, but we've not, I think we mm -hmm. should. Any, anybody else who's had some experience uh, having any regular safety huddles? That is a chance for staff to get together and in an organized fashion, a scripted fashion, what safety errors or near misses have we seen? Uh, what do we anticipate in the next 24 hours? What uh, areas uh, do we need to be aware of then, uh, to follow up on issues that have come up before? Um, uh, any, anyone doing uh, those kinds of things? Well, I, I can just tell you again, if you look sort of, uh, as, as Renee just said, hospital-wide, uh, these exercises which we now do literally daily in every one of the hospitals in the Yale New Haven system now has proven to be a remarkably rich source of discovery and of repair, uh, getting things done, getting them done efficiently, uh, pointing out where we have work to do. Very helpful. So, so I want to ask you fully again. I have one more comment about um, standardization and perception. We struggle with the use of the CDC um, tools in addition, which not necessarily conflicts but competes with the ESRD um, core survey training manual tools. And at a recent um, symposium that we had for Network 3, Dr. Priti Patel was there and you know, we shared our, our feelings about that. The CDC's tools are written more theoretical, where the survey tools are written much more procedural, and in our opinion, procedural is easier for the direct patient care staff to understand. 
CDC, if you have a background in a septic procedure and infection control, it, it, you understand it, but having the two major resources conflicting data, you know, we just shared our feelings um, at, a late, at our latest meeting. Great. So there are a number of other questions coming into the chat box, some about should we do more FEMA forward, you know, the forward look of risk mit mitigation rather than some of our more retroactive QAPI, and I, we certainly agree with that. I think that in the interest of time, probably what we should do is think about for our next seminar, which is going to focus on MedRec, um, thinking about next steps based on what we discussed today about how we can leverage some of the work that's already been done to try to improve safety and thinking about what we've gathered today of really learning what the frontline staff think and the managers to think about what we might want to do as, an, as a group to, um, to think what would be things we could do across the continuum and across the dialysis um, stakeholder group of providers and patients and other healthcare professionals to, to leverage all of what we've learned throughout the last several years that we've been addressing safety. Right. So as we, reach the, Alan? as we reach the top of the hour here, can I suggest that each of us uh, think about something proactively that would be helpful and send those ideas to Amy Beckrich and, and at the RPA. be really important to collect those so that we then, in the upcoming uh, sessions, and start to put together a thought and a uh, plan for uh, across our whole industry here uh, about where we need to go. So with that, I would like to thank Alan Kleiger and Tammy Keir and, of course, Renee Garrick as the chair of this effort, and thank each of you for participating today. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to join us, and we look forward to your participation on future patient safety webinars. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Hey, Alan?